I'd like to uh, uh, welcome everybody to our, uh, our Friday, our ninth uh, Family Business Friday Zoom at Noon program. We've had some amazing speakers as we do now, and, and uh, Tony Russo, who's one of the sponsors, is part of, uh, part of this. Um, as always, I want to uh, um, kind of say a little bit about who the Rothman Institute is, where our mission is to research, promote, and support entrepreneurship with a special focus on family and veteran businesses. We're part of Fairleigh Dickinson University. Um, we wouldn't exist without our sponsors, TD Charitable Foundation, Provident Bank, SunTrust, and CIA and J. Um, some of the programs that we have uh, for 30 years, we've been around 30 years, so we have student entrepreneurship programs. I teach a course called Family Business Management. Uh, I'm actually teaching a course uh, this summer on uh, innovation and uh, design thinking. Um, we have a family business alliance um, with uh, 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 a number of family businesses to really help, uh, help them grow. Um, we have our family business awards. We'll have our 28th this year. We're looking for nominations. Um, Sobel and Co. Has, uh, Sobel Co. has been a big partner in this. And so if you know of a family business or you are a family business, send us, a, send us some nominations at uh, rothman at fdu.edu. We have a program that just finished this week. Uh, for this session, we're going to have a national program in the, the summer called Veterans Launching Ventures. So veterans who have business ideas, we take them through a business planning process to help their businesses be successful. And we've had, uh, for the last five years, a wonderful small business series. So uh, we also have established something called Family Business Week. You probably haven't heard much about this, but it will be a big deal. The fourth week in October, we're calling it Family Business Week. And our idea is to have people identify and celebrate a family business that week. Um, that occurs the same time as our family business awards. But this year, because we have a big presidential election, you know, we're not taking sides. We're just saying vote family. And especially in this crisis, we're encouraging everybody to find small businesses, support small businesses, buy from small businesses. And if they're family businesses, all the better. Uh, also, there are a lot of, uh, this will be on our YouTube channel. Um, we have a lot of great information for those uh, who are looking for leadership information during the crisis. Obviously, our Family Business Friday call. And um, uh, we also have a small business poll. There are a number of polls out there. We're really trying to grow, um, grow this poll to more than 1,000 small businesses. It's done by the FDU Polling, a really uh, a, a nationally known polling group. We, we, want, we really want to hear the challenges of small businesses so that we can really um, work with Tony and others to, to really get that, that word out. So this crisis that uh, has, has brought us all together, we all know about. I like to, to really talk about, um, this is a slide that I've shown before, but I think it's important because the whole, the 2000, 2009, 2010, we know that crisis, it was horrible for many businesses, but there was only, and I say only 700,000 people who were unemployed. Uh, whereas you look at the crisis now, which is the latest uh, unemployment claims that I saw today are 38.6 million initial jobless claims. Unbelievable. 700,000 was the record. And obviously, as we'll talk about, the reason is because small business employs America. And uh, this is the, uh, the final chart where you really see almost 70% of the businesses are under 100 employees. Most of those have no employees. Um, about 20% are under 500, and uh, you can see where the small businesses fall. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to uh, introduce some friends of the firm, Alan Sobel, who's the managing member of Sobel Co., uh, <laughs> and Mike LaForge, who is a member of Sobel Co. They have a presentation, and uh, as I said, we're open for questions. Please send them through the chat box, and um, I'll, I'll stop my sharing, and then you can share. Okay. Alan? Michael, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen up here. Uh, and do this the right way. You guys, uh, you guys see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, great, perfect. So, um, Dale, thank you very much. And, uh, and Tony, uh, thanks for Commerce and Industries uh, support of the Rothman uh, Institute and Family Business Forum. Um, you know, like you, we are very much committed to the entrepreneurial family business. And um, it's an, such an important engine in our uh, economic community here in New Jersey, but throughout the country, but you know, especially here with New Jersey. And I do know that um, as opposed to perhaps many corporate 
large corporations that have resources and um, support mechanisms within, you know, within the hierarchy of their corporate elements. The family business relies on family and advisors to get them through these very, very difficult times. And I, and I empathize and I appreciate how stressful uh, this is for everybody. And so I applaud all of you for the, uh, the efforts that you're making and keeping your companies vibrant. And, uh, and I hope that we can just briefly share with you uh, some of our own thoughts in that regard. But as we move forward, most importantly, answer any questions and discuss topics that are relevant to you. So Mike and I are gonna go through, we have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation that's far longer than we tend to cover. Um, we're gonna really just fly through some very high level points here. And then you know, through Dale's uh, and uh, facilitation, we'll, we'll hope to address some of the questions along with Tony that you may have. So um, you know, with that, um, you know, I gotta get my thing to advance. <laughs> Okay, there we go. It's so what, we, what we've been asked to cover today is um, basically financial modeling, both uh, econ you know, income modeling and balance sheet modeling, but also cash flow modeling. Uh, the hottest topic that is out there and has been out there for, um, you know, since the CARES Act and even prior to that, that everybody's talking about is the Paycheck Protection Program. And so um, you're fortunate in that Mike is, you know, kind of an expert in this area. I know enough to be dangerous and you know, we'd be happy to address your questions in that regard. Um, because of the PPP and um, the, the CARES Act did have some various different tax um, provisions in it that a lot of people are not paying attention to that are quite advantageous to, uh, to business owners um, that it, we certainly will touch upon, but more importantly, answer any questions you may have. And then I think we can't lose sight of the fact that um, while all this is financial. There's a human aspect to everything that's being done in this crisis. And so we're going to talk a little, very briefly about um, strategy and tactical types of things and how you might work through that. Uh, and then again, be available for questions that you may have in that regard. So uh, uh, Dale kind of laid out very, very well what's really happening here in this crisis. And we're all experiencing and seeing it. And, you know, it's, it's led by the, uh, you know, the shelter in place provisions that every state put in. And it's led by, uh, not led by, but it's the, the cause of, you know, the, the result of that is this unprecedented unemployment levels, which is, uh, you know, just devastating uh, to our economy. Uh, it's devastating to many of your businesses. And then what overshadows all of this is just the uncertainties of what's going, what, what the future will bring. Um, I know we're all starting to get back to work uh, slowly and some of these provisions, these restrictions are being lifted. But, you know, if you read these reports, um, we just don't know what's next. Have the numbers been going down because we've been social distancing? Or is this a trend that will continue? And if, we, if it, the trend goes the other way, what, what's the next wave of this of the shutdown? So that uncertainty makes it particularly challenging for all of us that are managing businesses on what steps we take and what we need to do. Yeah, um, Alan, as an example on that, um, as, as businesses are going back and opening up shop and bringing in employees. You just read the paper yesterday that, you know, Ford was all set to gear up and, uh, and start running their, their plants to, to um, continue to manufacture or to get started ma manufacturing the uh, F-150 pickups. And they had to shut their plant down because they had a, um, uh, one of the workers show up who was, who, who had the virus. So like Alan said, the uncertainty is incredible because it's, you don't know, you don't know when you can start. You don't know when you're going to have to stop and then restart all over again. So it's certainly going to be a challenge, uh, you know, going forward. No question, Mike. And, and, you know, and then the uncertainty of how it impacts your customers and your supply chain and, you know, we can keep and your and your employees. Right. I mean, it's just all along the way. And we don't want to be you know, negative and dire here, but that's just the reality on the ground here. So we're all facing that uncertainty. And so um, when it comes to financial modeling, as you look through your family business, and I, you know, we get a lot of questions on this from our clients and we're talking to our clients, like, how do I predict any of this? Like, how can I possibly make predictions when it comes to the future of my business when I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring? And we recognize that it's very difficult. And so what we've done here is we, you know, we think that you should take a look at your, your start with your income statement, your, your, your cash flows, how are you driving your business? And how can you forecast what your revenue is going to look like? You know, we've unfortunately, we've had a little bit of probably the worst behind us right now in the sense of like what's happened over the last couple of uh, weeks. You know, we've been, we've been um, uh, 
having work, working remotely now for nine weeks as a firm. So we can get a pretty decent idea of, of how our workflow is going to work. I suspect that many of your businesses are starting to get sort of a, a sense of what's going on there. Um, so you have, to rev, you have to forecast your revenues. You have to forecast what your impact's gonna be from a supply chain point of view. Are you gonna buy more stuff sooner because you can't rely on the supply chain? Or are you going to uh, be able to rely on that supply chain and perhaps delay some of your purchases and preserve cash flow so that you can, um, you know, but still meet the demands of what your clients are looking to do? Um, Rebudgeting of selling and general administrative expenses, particularly things like travel and entertainment, those are areas where uh, rebudgeting needs to be done because nobody's traveling anywhere. I don't know, I don't have one client that is not under a no travel policy. And, you know, I guess the good news to that is there's no spending on airfare, there's no spending on hotels, there's no spending on T&E. The bad news to that is there are businesses and industries that are so dependent upon that that they're not receiving those revenues in the same place. And then there are other things that you need to decide about in that area of what you may defer um, or uh, you know, put off in terms of expenditures or, or perhaps make the difficult decisions about you know, layoffs and furloughs and reduction in compensation. All of those elements need to go into that financial forecasting. And then of course, you know, taxes may play into your cash flow. Uh, if you're making money, you gotta remember you're gonna have to pay um, our partners in New Jersey and in the federal government, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40% of what of those profits are going to be. If you're losing money, there are opportunities to potentially go back and claim those losses and recover some money that you've paid previously to free up cash flow. So that's something else to be considered in your modeling. Um, on so the balance and sheets. And, and, and also in the modeling, I think that what we've learned, um, not only by talking with our clients, but also learn just on our own because, you know, Sobelco is a business, is you have to be ready to pivot. You have to be able to react a little bit more quickly and sometimes, um, I don't want to say a little bit more dangerously, but taking a little bit more, more risk from the standpoint of, of what the next step are. When I say risk, it might be, you know, how you're investing or how you're keeping employees that, that maybe, um, you know, maybe should be furloughed only, uh, but, but again, the risk of letting these people go and then not having be able to, the, um, the ability to bring them back in when, when business gets back up. I had a conversation last night with somebody and they are struggling with decisions because they're in the travel industry. So you can imagine what they're going through and they're struggling with what to do with employees from the standpoint of, of furloughing them. And their fear is, is that they could be furloughing 150 years of experience. And then what happens if those years of experience aren't able to come back into the fold when things get geared up? So, you know, our advice has continued to be, you know, you can't have a, you know, you got a plan, uh, but the plan can change tomorrow. But what you need to at least do is address all these what ifs, and maybe you don't, you're not going to have a solid plan behind it, but at least you have some thought to it. In other words, at least you have an idea as to what direction or how you're going to pivot, when you're, whether or not you're going to go left, whether or not you're going to go right, or whether or not you're going to you know, stay still for a little bit. Yeah, Mike, good points, and, and, and thanks for that. And um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and dis those decisions are gut-wrenching because, particularly in a family business, you, you know, even though they may not be your bloodline, the people that you work with every single day and side by side every day are like family. And so I know that each of you do not, and we don't either, take these decisions very lightly. It's not, you know, kind of check the box type decisions. We're impacting people's lives. And I know that that's very difficult. Um, so in addition to the, in addition to sort of the P&L, the, the income statement and the cash flows, um, we also need to think about what the impact and where we are on our balance sheet. How does that create liquidity for us? Because liquidity is key. And these times, that's what really is important is the access to cash. Because as things slow up, you still want to have bills to pay um, and you have still obligations you need to take care of and having the, uh, that liquidity will help you do that. So, you know, you need to assess your customer terms or, you know, you may have 30 day terms, but your customers are now going to pay you in 45, 60, perhaps even in some cases, 90 days. Some of them may be looking for some discounts on their, uh, on their receivable balances um, that you need to consider in there. 
On the inventory side, as I mentioned previously, you need to figure out how to manage that inventory. You may have had in the past an inventory turn of say three or four times a year. Um, now you may need to kind of get that to five and six times in order to manage your cash level better. Um, on the property and equipment side, uh, is, there, is there excess property and equipment that you can sell that you're really not really benefiting from that would create some liquidity for you? Or equally important, did you have capital improvement plans that you might want to defer because right now is not the time to be undertaking a large capital expenditure? Um, you know, if you notice, this is kind of working down the balance sheet here. If you go next to your vendor terms, that's like the accounts payable area. What can you do to lean on your vendors a little bit to get the same terms that your customers are asking you? Can you get longer terms from your vendors? Um, can you get discounts potentially for paying quicker, which would create more liquidity in the long run, even though in the short run, it's utilizing cash? Um, just keep in mind that has a cascade effect. Just like when your customers come to you and ask for relief, when you go to your vendors and ask for relief, that's hurting them in some way. And so most of our clients, I think most of you view your vendors as strategic partners. And so, you know, don't take advantage of situations as our advice. Do what you need to do under circumstances, but know that if you take advantage of the next time you come to the well, they might not be there for you. So treat them like a partner in your business and treat them with the respect that they deserve. Um, and I don't know, yep. uh, Alan, let me just interject something. I don't know what other people have been experiencing through the last uh, eight or nine weeks from the standpoint of, of vendors and, uh, and also customers, but the level of cooperation and the level of understanding among the groups is, in my mind, has been incredible. Um, everybody knows that this is a common disaster, if you want to term it that way. It's not regionalized like 9-11 was or Sandy. Uh, when I say 9-11 was, I mean, it was, it, it was somewhat regionalized from the standpoint of the impact on the New York, uh, New Jersey metropolitan area and Washington, D.C. But um, it's national. And the cooperation that I've seen amongst all these groups has been kind of amazing. It's actually been very, very good because um, people are understanding because uh, they're feeling they're feeling what the other side is expressing to them as as the struggles. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that cooperation continues to uh, go forward. And we also encourage our clients and we encourage everybody to you know try to continue as best they can with this level of cooperation because it, I think it does make this a little bit easier to deal with. Agreed. Um, just real quickly here on the long-term and short-term debt, evaluate your situation currently. Do you have debt coming due? Can you refinance um, you know, your debt in a way to extend out your terms on, especially on the long-term piece of things? Uh, PPP, the um, protection program is certainly, uh, if you haven't applied for it already, most have, and there is some availability left, I encourage you to do that. Uh, but that is also a great way to create liquidity and, in fact, will help your businesses because of the forgiveness portion. And then last but not least is capital. And what I really want to say here is that, um, you know, this is your money, right? This is the money that you might invest back in your business. And most, uh, most business owners that I know have been very fortunate over the years to be able to fulfill a whole lot of dreams and aspirations for themselves and their families through the family business. And they've taken out biz money. And while they put money in initially, you know, they haven't necessarily had to recapitalize the business from time to time. You're going to be faced with a decision potentially where you may need to put some money into your business. And I know that's a difficult thing to do because you don't want to, you don't want to risk, you don't want to put that at risk. But having said that, uh, if you've got a strong and a solid business, you know, that's a fair decision to make if you have outside capital to potentially put that back into the business and or in a sort of a backdoor way, potentially cut back significantly on your own compensation as a way of putting capital into the business. So I think these are all the things that you might want to consider. Um, I'm going to, ju oh, just one other thing here um, that's important. Because it's difficult to predict the future, um, we believe very strongly in the concept of a 13-week cash flow model. 13 weeks is basically a little over two months, two and a half months, um, maybe almost three months. Um, and yeah, it's three months. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. You know, Mike knows I'm terrible with numbers. <laughs> it's and that quarter. doesn't sound good for me from an accountant, but it's true. I'm more logic It's a, it's a quarter. It's yeah. a quarter. It's a but quarter. anyways, uh, it's basically one quarter's worth of, uh, of cash flow. And it should be reasonably easy to predict what's going on in the quarter. Because, you know, it's sort of taking about 
maybe a third to a half of what's been already done. Um, from a cash flow point of view, sales that have already been made, uh, you know what the terms are, the purchases that have already been made, you know what you need to pay, you know what your payroll is going to look like. And so it's a little bit easier to predict 13, cash, 13 weeks of cash flow. And so we strongly recommend that's what you do. You can blow it out beyond that, but it's really those 13 weeks that are most relevant. We've, we've, um, noticed, that, we've noticed that banks have been asking some clients to provide them with um, 13, cash, uh, 13 week cash flow um, uh, spreadsheets just to, so the bank understands where there might be uh, uh, areas where additional or expanded uh, lendings uh, are there. So if your bank does approach you in that area, it's not the worst thing to do because they, they will have your uh, forecast and that type of stuff uh, ready to go in case you do have to dip into um, you know, that marketplace to get additional funds. Good advice. So I'm gonna fly through here. Uh, we'll take any questions you want on PPP as they come up. Um, just real quickly on the tax changes. Um, there's some depreciation changes that might be helpful to your business. There were limitations on interest deductions. That's been changed. Uh, there's probably the one that's most widely applicable is you can defer the payment of Social Security taxes for the balance of the year or until you receive forgiveness on your PPP loan. That could generate some additional cash flow for you in the short term. And then there's also some retirement plan changes that you might be want to be mindful of. Again, we'll be happy to address any of these uh, as we go along. And then, you know, Mike is going to talk to you a little bit about some management and strategy issues, and then we'll open it up to, uh, to Dale and Tony. Perfect. Yeah, Alan, I just want to go back to the, uh, to the one thing, because I think it's pretty important on the, um, on, on the tax changes, because, you know, because a lot of, um, you know, the, the family businesses and, uh, and everybody's been focusing so much on the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, a lot of these things that are available from, from, from a tax standpoint have basically been a little bit overlooked and, and, uh, and pushed aside a bit, um, especially things regarding the carry backs and carry forwards. There was a lot of things that were taken off the, off the tax uh, uh, plate back when we had the, um, um, you know, the act back in 2017 that have been re, you know, re, re reestablished. You know, one of them is the uh, interest limitations have been lifted, uh, the ability to carry back losses and carry forward losses, which again, uh, was gone as of 2018, but now it's back. And then the other one that's on the top of that list, uh, many of our small business clients and many, many of the family uh, businesses do operate out of uh, leased facilities. So what happens there is, is that, you know, that was actually a, a technical correction from the 2017 Act, but it allows you now to depreciate um, improvements, you know, leasehold improvements over a 15-year period instead of a 39-year period, and allows you to go back and, and do that for 2018, even if you've gone and, um, you know, filed your own ta your tax return. So these things are, uh, pr there's pretty good stuff, I think, up, up and down the line here. You do get the sense that, um, you know, the hands are out there to help. We just got to make sure that, you know, you're taking advantage of those things. Um, you know, Alan talked about management and strategy and, and so on. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not naive to think that, um, you know, the people on this call and, and people in small in, in family businesses aren't on top of things within their business. I mean, they know their suppliers, they know their customers, they know, uh, you know, things much, much, much more than, um, uh, than, than Alan or I could ever share, you know, in, in that regard. Um, but one of the things that I think that is just a little bit of a change in pace is understanding the enormity of this thing. Like I said before, you know, struggles in the past were, were localized to an industry or localized to a geographical, a geographical area. This is, this is everywhere. This is affecting small business, big business, and so on and so forth. And um, I think people have to, you know, look at it that way. And, and like I said before, maybe you're not going to be able to have a game plan that's going to fix every situation. But I do think that you have to at least think about it and have some, something formulated in, in, your, in your mind from the standpoint of how, over, you know, how, how reaching this, this, this crisis is. Um, I give you an example, you know, you, you may have a, a business that's a wholesale distributor, but you know, as you're formulating your plan and trying to figure out what you're gonna do and, and strategies, you know, it's not just you and your customers, it's your manufacturers that are bringing the product or getting the product into your warehouse, 
it's now going to your customers, which might be retailers, and it's not, then your retailers who have to turn around and sell it to the, um, to the ultimate consumers. So again, you're dealing with the struggles of all, in that particular case, all four of those, the, 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 those areas, you know, again, manufacturer, distribution, um, retail sale, and then consumer in this. And like I said, you can't have a plan to, to cover every single item that may go astray. You may not have, you can't have a plan to figure out, you know, whether or not there's going to be, uh, you know, you know, the retail sale and so on and so forth. But I think what you need to do is you need to at least understand that everything is going to be affected right from the standpoint of, of, of the goods going to your manufacturer uh, for that standpoint. Um, you know, a lot of family business, a lot of clients, they import products from China. Um, and again, you know, you, you have issues there from the standpoint of, you know, the cargo coming in and, and how it's going to get to the port and how it's going to get you rest. So, like I said, I think what happens there is that the whole thought process is going to have to change. It's going to have to, um, you know, go into a lot more detail uh, that you never would have even considered. And like I said, it's going to be very difficult for you to come up with solid plans for each one. You're not going to be able to go in there and, and have this, this, this type of game plan that you're used to having. But it's going to have to be something that's adaptable. It's going to be, have to be something where, you know, as you're taking, um, you know, hits and, and so on, um, that you know how you're going to, you know, deflect them or get up off the canvas to, to, to go to the next round. Um, I wish I could provide you with this wonderful vision that's going to come about, you know, what the next 12 months are, go are going to say. Um, again, we've been suggesting take it off in small pieces, look at 13, uh, 13 weeks, look at your next quarter. Keep those items, uh, you know, keep that, 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 that look going forward. Don't drop off and say, gee whiz, I'll, I'll look at my next quarter in, uh, in eight weeks or something like that. You know, keep those things rolling forward to be able to keep your pulse on, on the business. Um, we've heard terms in the past, you know, um, and again, you, you, I say this tongue in cheek completely, but, you know, don't let a, uh, a, a good downturn go, go to waste. Now, sometimes you can look at these things and have opportunities, whether it's opportunities to, um, you, know, you hate to say it, but you know, you may find a struggling business that may be one that is, is that, that would fold real nicely into, into your current business. Look at those things. Um, I know it's difficult to do when you've got all these other struggles and stresses, you know, going on, you know, how am I going to go out and look for an acquisition? Um, when, uh, when, when, when I'm struggling with, you know, making sure my employees are here and, 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 and my vendors are taken care of. Well, you're right. It's not going to be easy, but it might be something where, you know, you're looking at this whole bit from, from the standpoint of strategy. Um, it could be markets. It could be things where you are able to take advantage of, of, of certain markets or certain areas where things can't be delivered by competitors or where you can fill in space that is, um, that's not being filled right now because of this. So, you know, the thought process is changing. I think everybody needs to have a, a wide open mind, a clean you know, piece of paper, and, and don't be afraid to talk to other people about it. Don't be afraid to talk to um, you know, associates or people within your, your, your business chain and that type of stuff. Because you know, you know, I keep on seeing this thing, you know, we're, we're all home alone. No, it's, um, we're not alone, we're safe. One of those terms, I can't remember how it goes. But again, we're all in this together, we're not alone. And there's, you know, there's plenty of uh, you know uh, people out there that that are glad to talk about things and and to help you through these times. And you know, the fact that you're even on this on this Zoom at noon, uh, Zoom at noon, um, does show that there is a lot of support network uh, you know available to people. Yeah, we we have. Well, thank you, thank you both. This is great. We have a number of questions, but I always try to to have Tony ask some questions or or comment. Tony. Yeah. No. Thank you, Dale, and thanks, Alan and, and Mike. You know, one of the things that I've heard since, um, I guess, day one of this crisis in the CARES Act and the PPP um, was that a lot of the... Are you there, Tony? Um, did not <laughs> Oh, he froze. Okay, he froze. Well, let, let me ask a, qu a question while we're waiting for Tony. Um, for Tony uh, to unfreeze. <laughs> to unfreeze. And now, yeah, we're having more and more, more problems with the internet. Um, so one, I'm hearing more and more about bankruptcy. You know, have there been any changes to the bankruptcy law? And, and that, that is top of mind. I hear in so many, especially salons and others going out of business. But, but thoughts about that and the tax implications? 
So I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I mean, to be very honest with you, I have not heard anything relative to changes in rules and laws. I mean, I think it's a little premature at this point to see how this is all going to play itself out relative to the bankruptcy. Of right. course, I mean, taxes don't necessarily play into that. Um, you know, there are forgiveness of debt rules and, and, you know, there have been some precedents about like in the 2008 crisis, they changed some of the rules relative to the, re, um, uh, the, re, the foreclosure of properties and the tax implications around that. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think you're right. I think that there's going to be, unfortunately, a tremendous amount of um, for, uh, uh, bankruptcies because people aren't going to have the capital to get themselves started again. Yeah. So, it's, it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 sad, the, the sad part about that is that, you know, many of the businesses that are out there, um, I don't want to say they're poorly capitalized, but they're not capitalized to be able to go three months without having their normal revenue stream. As a matter of fact, I think people are very aware of, you know, even in the retail industry, um, you lose, you lose a fall period that goes into the, uh, you know, uh, uh, holiday season. Um, 50-50 that you're even going to be able to open up again in, in January. It's just very, very tight. And it's not something that's a new phenomena. It's just the way it seems to be in for a lot of the smaller retail uh, uh, situations. Well, their margins are slim. Their margins are slim. I mean, even a Memorial Day weekend, you miss a Memorial Day weekend, that can kill some businesses. And, and yeah. you know, the, the, the challenge that I've said every, every week is, you know, big businesses and unions have money for lobbyists. You know, small businesses don't have margins for that. And that's why I think a lot of leaders around the country were, were, were just hitting the head. They didn't realize that small businesses employ more people than anybody else. So uh, um, now one, one person had asked about the PPP uh, tax wise that there's some rumors that the IRS is not going to allow you to write off some of the normal business expenses. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I, 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 Mike, if you don't mind, I'll address that because I saw the question and it asked what's the accounting community doing about it. And, I'm in a kind of unique situation to maybe comment on that as um, I, I serve on what's now called, well, I'm serving on what's called the American Institute of CPAs Council. It's a governing body and we just actually had a call, uh, our, our council meeting on Tuesday. Um, so yes, the IRS, IRS has put out a position that said, even though the legislation on the PPP said that the forgiveness of debt would not be income, the IRS has turned around and said, yeah, but the deductions will not be um, allowed to be deducted, will not be tax deductible, which in effect means it's taxable. Mm -hmm. um, the AICPA, uh, along with the accounting industry in general, is absolutely pushing hard back on this particular area. Um, we think that that is not the intent of the legislation. Um, we think it's actually um, sort of unfair dealing. It's like changing the rules. The whole notion here is to create relief for businesses. By doing this, you essentially reduce the relief associated with the forgiveness component by about 40%. So instead of thinking you're getting a dollar, you're really only getting 60 cents. And many businesses made decisions relative to keeping people employed. Remember, we don't get 100% reimbursement on employment. If you're paying somebody greater than $100,000, you're capped at $100,000. If you kept them employed, it's costing you money. Part of that was because you thought that you were not going to be taxed on this forgiveness. Interesting. Uh, payroll taxes are not included. That is also going to cost you money. And so, so the whole notion here is they change the rules. The IRS is attempting to change the rules. Here's what I can tell you. The AICPA in discussions with senators and congressmen all believe that what the IRS did was wrong. Mm -hmm. And they will, they say that they need to legislate. They need to write a rule that says the deductions are allowed. Okay. Now, Tony, you might be able to comment on this better than I do. And I know you're mostly state oriented, but if you think you can get a clean bill of just that through the, the House and the Senate in Washington, I've got a bridge to sell you because, and that's the problem here. You cannot get legislation done uh, these days. And so I don't know personally what's going to happen. I know there's an intense lobbying effort to get in that area. And, uh, and hopefully they will see the error of their ways. Well, Tony's back. Tony, you sat there patiently. Yeah. The second you spoke, the, the internet. <laughs> and I, I got kicked off, so I, I'm sure I missed a lot. But uh, the question that I was going to ask both Alan and Mike is uh, from day one, and you guys hit it on the head about cash flow, cash is king. And the, the triple P, I heard from a lot of our members that received it, said, well, they didn't really want to take it anymore because they couldn't generate the revenue, you know, to bring their people back. So here they brought their people back, and now nobody's really 
um, you know, really doing business with one another. So I wanted to get your take that you think looking back at this, you know, maybe Congress should have, uh, you know, and I get that the PPP was for paycheck protection, but do you think it would have been better served if the money was just grant money to infuse back into the economy so people could pay their payables? Because if one business gets their pay, uh, you know, invoices paid, and maybe I'll do business with somebody else. It seemed like all this money is in there. It got tied up paying salaries, which was important, but a lot of the companies aren't doing business with each other and that cash flow froze. And uh, some, some actually gave the PPP money back, you know, even if it was 1% interest, uh, they just, they couldn't generate revenue. So I'm just curious if you had to do it over again, would you just keep it simple and just here's a bunch of cash you know, pay your bills, bring your employees back, but do business with each other, you know, because that was the key. Yeah, uh, let, let me just comment. You know, I remember, you know, I, I think one of the things that people have to, uh, people have to understand is how quickly, how quickly this thing turned around from the standpoint of the legislation. Um, I use, I use the um, cancellation of the basketball game out in um, Arizona as the tipping point. Once, once they had everybody come in and sent everybody home, uh, when the two players uh, tested positive, that sort of set the domino effect. Because if you recall, at that, up to that point in time, there was conversation but, and there was concern, but nothing like what happened over that two or three week period right through, I think it was uh, March 27th or whatever it was. It was just incredible. So I don't know whether or not Congress and, and everybody had the time or the opportunity to go through and really button everything up to make this a, make this a perfect a perfect uh, law that fit every situation. I also recall that during the time um, in between when the CARES Act came out and when the money was being dispersed, there was a there was a part on the AICPA where they were trying to get uh, um, a, a a process through where the money wouldn't be dispersed to the entities to, to the companies, but would be dispersed through uh, the payroll companies. So in other words, through ADP and, and, and paychecks and places like that as a way to make sure that people continue to get paid. That was, I took that as being the intent was, was to cut back on the unemployment more so than anything else. And I think what's happened is, is that it's turned out that possibly that's not what happened. Um, I think the unemployment numbers continued to go and as, as Dale showed you, they're, they're just like through the roof, they're mind boggling. Um, there's been some, uh, I know the ASCPA also was um, uh, getting in front there to see whether or not businesses had the ability to move the covered period around. So in other words, I got my money April 1st, can I start my eight week period sometime in June when I'm back, you know, back to going? That really didn't go anywhere. So um, I don't know that any client that I'm working with, I don't know about you, Alan, has, has turned the money back because of that, you know, because of the fact that they didn't bring everybody back to work. I mean, right now what they're doing is they made, they made business decisions. And if they, the business says, you know, bring the person back because they're available to work, they brought them back. Now that's not, you know, that's not in every single case. You know, there's still companies that I know that you know, have a receptionist that they furloughed or, 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 or is not coming in, but they're still paying them because of PPP. Um, but for the most part, you know, if there was no work, they didn't bring the people, you know, they, they didn't bring the, bring the people back right away. Um, and that's going to be a problem because they're not going to have the available, they'll have the available funds um, it, because they didn't spend it currently during the covered period, but they're not going to get the forgiveness. So it is a somewhat of a, of, of, of a sword there. It's an unfair result, Tony. Yeah, um, it's an unfair result. Because if you brought people, employees back and you were literally shut down, it cost you money. And the whole idea here is you didn't have money to spend. And so Mike's right. You can use the loan, but you're not going to get the forgiveness unless the rules are changed. Right. It's unfair. Yeah, well, that's why I guess if they had to do it over again, again, I don't want to dismiss the fact that paying employees is number one. But I think what they failed to understand is that cash flow dried up. People were holding on to their money, right? They didn't want to spend their money because they didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I talked to landscapers. I talked to, they're like, Tony, we're doing the work, but we know we're not going to get paid for 90 days, if, if ever, you know, but what were they going to do? They had the staff, they had their, their workers come on in and, you know, a lot of, and I'm hearing that across all the sectors that, you know, they're doing the work, they're trying to deal with clients. Now, whether or not they're getting paid for that work, 
it may take so, 60 days. But Tony, that's actually a good use of the PPP because they'll get two months worth of payroll covered. Even if they don't collect from their customers, they'll get that. So they at least have the work. I think the bigger problem is like a, a retail, uh, maybe a, a hair salon or a uh, an eyelash uh, place that, you or, know, they or, don't have, or a they don't, or a they're, bringing, they're paying people for doing nothing. Right. Yeah. Or a restaurant. You, you, you drive down, whether you're driving down Route 10, Route 22, Route 46, whatever, you drive down and you look at all those businesses, they're all closed. Yep. They're all closed. Yep. Um, and what happened there is, is that they couldn't even open if they wanted to and use them and spend the money on payroll if they wanted to. So yes, that's where, that's where the flaw comes in. That's where the flaw comes in. The, uh, and good, good question. Tony, anything else? Any, uh, good. thank you guys. Well, you're, you're part of, uh, I'm part of the main street, part of the governor's uh, restart and recovery, uh, group. And I know Tony, you're, you're part of, uh, of the restart group as well. And so announcement that, um, uh, Tim Sullivan had to leave our meeting early because he had a special board meeting and they were supposed to approve $50 million in money for small businesses. So uh, the governor, I think it announced it on Monday. So uh, there should be some more, and I don't know if uh, Mike Allen, you know anything about that, but um, you know, keep your eyes open on the websites. There will be some additional money. Um, so um, so that's, that's, uh, that's good news. Uh, yeah, well, that's, inter that's interesting you said that, Dale, because again, um, in a lot of these cases, you know, people aren't going to come knocking on your door. You know, it's, this is not the, the Girl Scouts selling cookies. So yep. um, there, there is some diligence that people have to, uh, you know, get up in the morning and check the sites, you know, just like we've been doing. And early, Mike, and, and again, Tony had mentioned, and, 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 and then I'd, I'd mentioned as well, I think EDA, Tony had what, about the first, in the first hour had 30,000 applications for the previous. Yeah. I mean, it's, right. it's um, it, it really is, is a crisis. And, and I want to go back to that whole idea of, of, of vendor terms. And so one of, the, one of the, the folks online was saying that the big companies are saying, we're going to extend it 30 days and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. And so I don't know if there should be legislation to say that you have to may pay small businesses in a certain period of time. If you're doing business in New Jersey, and I may suggest that on the, on the committee, um, because it's, that's a crisis. It's, it's about cash flow. Right. And the other thing, just for you, both of you who are on the com committee, um, the, the incentive money that was put out by the EDA, the application was so complicated uh, and required so much, you know, material, you've got to simplify the process. I will say the beauty of the PPP program is it was very easy to apply. Mm -hmm. And New Jersey has a reputation of regulation and making things difficult. If we can emphasize simplicity is going to be the key here, I think it'll be a, a huge benefit to all businesses. It, it really will. The, one of the other questions I have is somebody had, had uh, um, they were really scared of what was going to happen. So they, they drew down their credit line. They have cash. Um, they seem to be doing okay. Should they pay it back? What do you think? I, I've, I've had, a, I, you know, we had, uh, we had several clients, uh, just about every client that, that, that I work with um, did draw down on their credit lines in, mm. in uh, you know, back in, uh, uh, March. And uh, th we've gone through that same question. And um, some of them paid it back. Some of them have not. I think what happens now is, is that it, it, each each entity is is unique from the standpoint of knowing, you know, what direction things are going. I mean, you know, we, we now have um, whatever it is, we're, we're, we're into May. So there's some known, uh, there's still a lot of unknown, but we know now more, uh, more now than we did back in uh, in March. So I, you know, like I said, I've had a couple of clients pay it back and the other ones look at it and say, listen, you know what? I'm looking at this as an insurance policy. If I got to pay some interest. That's fine. I also pay insurance and I hope I never have to make a claim. Right. right. And, and Dale, I just would add two things to that. Number one, I think there's a lot of uncertainty still. And I hate to be, you know, the, kind of the, uh, the scared person, but, you know, part of the reason, the big part of the reason the numbers are looking better is because we've all socially distanced this disease has not gone away. And I think we're gonna to have to see what happens in terms of when people start getting back to normal and what that might impact businesses on. Um, the second thing is I would caution people and pay back in their line of credit if they took a PPP loan because the proceeds of the PPP loan are, you know, are specifically to be used for certain purposes. And so if you're gonna use it to pay down your line, you better A, make sure that you're able to demonstrate that it's not PPP money you're using to, to pay down the line of credit and the second thing is you had to make the statement that you thought that there was going to be an impact from this virus. And that's why you took the money. And if you're doing, 
if you're, if you're doing well enough to pay back your loan without the future risks that may be there, you may be contradicting your statements. So be careful. Well, and that kind of one of the other questions is, you know, I haven't really been impacted by COVID-19. Should I still apply for PPP? You know, I, I, that's an individual decision people have to make. Um, I, I think the notion you have, the, the decision tree that I ask clients to go through, and we did for our own firm, is we said, first of all, is there substantial risk? And I think the answer is probably yes to almost everybody. Right. Um, the second question then would become, is there still risk? Um, and then the, third, the, the, uh, the other element is, do you have sufficient liquidity? Even if there's not risk, is there sufficient liquidity in your business that you would need to take right. that loan? If you can answer those three questions, yes, you should do it. I, I think if you don't apply for the money and you have a legitimate reason, you're actually, um, you're, not, you're, not doing, you're not acting in a fiduciary capacity for your business. Now, I don't think you should just take the money because it's there. Um, right. I think if your business is a solid business, um, that's a whole other thing. And there are some businesses that are thriving in this thing. What's not clear on the PPP program is once you apply for forgiveness, and let's assume that your year turns out to be pretty good, everything came out well. What are the provisions at that point in time to return that money? Right now, there, none exists. And right. so I think people are going to have to decide how they handle that. Uh, I don't believe that this program is, in, is intended to enrich people. It's to throw a lifeline to help people keep their people employed. And so, you know, I've heard from, from people that said to me, well, you're in the accounting industry. You don't need this money. We do need this money. I, I will tell you that had we not received this PPP money, probably not on April 15th, because we had a lot of work that still needed to get done, but probably around now, we would have probably furloughed or let somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 25 people go, because we're anticipating that we will see somewhere in the neighborhood of about seven to 10% drop in revenues. And that's what the PPP forgiveness represents for us about that. So, you know, everybody, yeah, our business is good, but our clients are suffering. So they may not be in a position to pay us. We may be doing work right now that we're not going to get paid for. And then there's obviously special projects and other work that may not come about transactional type of stuff that we may have in, have in the future. So yeah, we're busy at the moment, but we don't know whether we're going to get paid. And I suspect most businesses are in that same boat right now with the risk element. So. And, and let me, let me just add something, you know, that was one of the things that I think everybody struggled with because at the time when the loan applications came out, you know, the understanding was, is that um, here it is, keep the people employed, you know, get you through these times. But then, you know, a couple of weeks later, then all of a sudden we started hearing these rumblings about, you know, the sign off and the certification and give it back and, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of clients struggled with that from the standpoint of, you know what, can I make a go of it? Yeah, I can make a go of it, but am I going to, you know, furlough 10% of my staff. Um, and that was a very, very um, a tough thing to do. But you, you look at some, you know, some uh, entities and that type of stuff. You know, at some point in time, I think, you know, the recipients of the PPP money are going to be, you're going to be able to see who they were, who took the money and that type of stuff. Because I think that that came into play too, because you have to be, you had to be prepared at a point in time to know that people are going to know you took the money. And for some businesses, who knows what ABC company does? Who knows what XYZ? But, you know, if you're, if you're in a law firm and that type of stuff, a prominent law firm, I think you got to be, can consider the, the fact that there may be some backlash. Same thing with accounting firms. Same thing with, you know, some of these real, real visible companies that are out there that are doing, that, that are probably doing very, very good business. Um, you have to understand that. I do work with a client and I was, it was kind of incredible when we were going through this thing. Um, the business is doing very, very well. Um, part of it is because of the pandemic and the product that they produce. And um, she said right off the bat, you know, the bank was pushing for it. The bank was pushing for it. She goes, I'm not taking it. I don't need it. I don't need to be uh, enriched in a way that it wasn't meant to be. I'm keeping my people employed. Good. She could have taken it. She could have taken it. She could have gotten all those wages forgiven. But you know what? That wasn't in her DNA. Right. The... Uh... Well, a couple of things I'm going to build on. Courtney Villani, who's one of our, our regular, you know, she's the CEO of a 100-year-old bus company. And so she and I have been talking about some of the but challenges. But she's not driving 100-year-old buses, right? No, she's no. The brand there's new no buses. horse and wagon, right? Brand new buses. She's not driving anything right now, but brand new buses. But she made a point, which I heard from the chairman of the Federal Reserve on uh, 60 Minutes, which was good. And, and now whether they're going to do something about it. But he said that 
you know, the longer these businesses go, you know, these businesses are being closed and they're not coming back. The same thing, the longer people are unemployed, they're not going to find jobs. And so it's really critical. And it's interesting to hear a government person saying that we've got to do stuff now. We really have to, and that's what we've been pushing. I asked that today at our, our call for the Restart Recovery Commission. But I don't know you as some thoughts, and I'll put this out there. I'm on the commission. You, you, you know, our websites, our, our emails, rothman at fdu.edu. I want your ideas. Email me your ideas, and we'll get them right to the governor. Um, do you have any thoughts? If you, you folks are brilliant at, at strategy, tax strategy, what, do you, what, what, what should we be saying if we were sitting with the governor now? And we've invited the governor on this, and their people are thinking about coming to this one Friday. What, what should we say? What should Tony and I, as we, we say, what, what do you think they should say, we should say? Alan, you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> I would be saying exactly, Tony knows this. He's heard, it. <laughs> he's, heard me, he's heard this line from me before. We need to do everything we can to make New Jersey not a better place to do business, but the best place to do business. Um, we, need to, we need to loosen up regulations. Um, we need to make it easier for people to do businesses in the state. We need to find some industries that really can thrive in this state, whether it's green technologies or uh, a, re, you know, a revamping of the pharmaceutical areas. We need to bring jobs to New Jersey. What we don't need to do is tax people. We have, I, I know the tendency here is our revenues are gonna be down, let's go to the well and let's get people. But with this outward migration, the people who pay the taxes are the ones who are most mobile and that will work against us. So I feel very strongly that Revenues need to be, um, you know, we, we need to get revenues up by driving business, not by, um, by increasing taxes. And we need to make it an easier place with which to do business. This is an opportunity, in my view, to completely transform, to pivot as a word that everybody does, or do a paradigm shift in the way that New Jersey is recognized in this, in the business community. And that's the way I want to go. And I'm not making this as a political statement, but just as an observation, I'm not optimistic about our current governor's ability to do that because he does have a very progressive agenda, which I don't fault in a healthy economy, but you can't, you can't take, do all that when you're suffering. So that, that, that's the advice that I would have. And I know you guys are hearing that from everybody. So it's not unique. The uh, great, um, you know, great, great comment. And, and again, we want to hear from, from those folks out there. So uh, a couple things. You know, one of the challenges that a lot of businesses are having is that with some of the, the unemployment subsidies and, and you know, the federal you know, kick in for that, there are a lot of employees that, that don't want to work, you know, that don't want to come back to work. There are a lot of employees that are looking for work. You know, what are you seeing from the employee tent standpoint, from taxes and other things? What are some of your clients dealing with when it comes to, uh, to those kinds of issues? Well, um, we are seeing struggles with uh, clients getting people to come back to work. Um, it started, started when the crisis started, uh, where, you know, the, the, um, you know, you look back and you see that that federal kick in as far as the unemployment, um, very, very well intended. But I think in some regards, um, it had some consequences that people just didn't, uh, didn't see at the time. Um, you know, what's, what's best? Uh, I think the combination, though, uh, the combination of having um, issues with, with child care um, also lend a, a hand to that. You know, there are, there are a lot of households where um, there is no alternative to having somebody watch your, 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 your children. And, you know, a parent does have to stay home, um, regrettably, not regrettably, but the, the sheer fact of the matter is, is that not everybody can work at home. Um, that's one of the things that is driving me a little, gets me a little bit upset because I keep on hearing from certain people, this, this is great. I'm working from home. I can't beat it. I was on the, the phone this morning with somebody and he said exactly that. He goes, I'm never going back to my office. This is fantastic. It works for some people, but for the most of the population, it does not work for. So it, it is going to be very difficult, uh, at least temporarily, to get these people, you know, a lot of people to come back to work. Um, I'm hoping that um, you know the the childcare situation gets fixed very quickly because I don't have a statistic, but I gotta believe that what 10 to 20 percent of the people that are working have have some sense of uh, you know some uh, child or elder care uh, issues that they have to deal with. 
So um, until we can get these things opened up, I think it's going to be a continued problem. Yeah, Dale. The only thing I would say, Dale, is, you know, one of the things, and, and you're on the Main Street, I'm on the manufacturing supply chain. What we're urging the governor to do, and he hasn't done yet, is give us dates, right? I mean, people need to plan. You know, I can't tell you how many of my, our, our members have said to me, you know, I can't just start, you know, right away, you know, a day later, I got to plan for these things. I got to, who's coming back, who's not. And there's never a good time for a crisis, but think about when this crisis hit during the spring. And, and, and a lot of our economy is based on seasonal, right? It's seasonal. I've talked to the movers in the moving industry. They're down 30, 40, 50% because people aren't moving. You think about the landscaping industry, right? This, this is their time to shine. Think about the tourism side down the shore. You know, if, if we lose the month of June, then half their season is gone because a lot of their money would have been made in May and June. So, you know, I know Dale and I are, are on these task forces and we tell the governor all the time, give us dates. I mean, you know, it's, it's important. And I'm not trying to dismiss the healthcare side of it, you know, and luckily the, everything is on a downward trend. All we're saying is start to plan ahead so people could reopen and people could plan. And, and right now that's the most important thing is give us dates. Yeah, yeah. The, um, um, you know, one of the things that, that um, I heard on the national news is that it's not passed as quickly on surfaces as people thought and that it's actually really more face to face. And so that's where, you know, the mask, if, you, you know, if you're not six feet, you have a mask on and others. So, so there are ways to work around that. Let's tell, we can't go before talking about taxes, the, the, you know, the extension of the, of the tax filing and, and what advice are you given around individual and business taxes with, uh, with the changes? Well, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, again, the, the change that you're talking, I mean, there's, there's two separate things here. The, you, know, you know, one question, one, one piece is, you know, the deferral piece. In other words, I didn't have to write out a check on, on April 15th. Um, but now on Jan uh, July 15th, at least for federal purposes, I'm writing three. I'm, I'm writing a check for what I owed last year, and I'm writing a check for my first, uh, my first and second installments for the 2020 taxes. But, you know, what we've been doing here is, um, you know, in many cases what you do is you base your 2020 estimates on what you paid in 2019. Well, that's certainly not going to happen. I think people have to do a little bit of due diligence in that regard and, and, and understand that. Uh, 2020 is not going to be what 2019 was. So, you know, that's, that's been a small adjustment. We've already gone out and made some alterations to 2018 tax filings. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there was a, actually, it was a correction that came through the, um, you know, the tax piece that was a, a um, you know, a problem from the 2017 Act. Uh, for um, leasehold improvement property. So we've already gone out and been amending old tax, you know, 18 tax returns uh, mm -hmm. and getting money back into clients' hands. I got returns sitting right over there, $30,000 going back to for, for a, a client uh, as, because of that, because we went back and recalculated the depreciation. Mm -hmm. So we're doing things like that. Um, we're certainly following up with clients for the uh, deferral portion of the uh, Social Security the, the tax, the 6.2%. Um, which um, if you're not in the PPP program, goes right through December 31st. If you are, it goes to the point where you're scanning your application to the bank. Okay. So, um, you know, those are all things that we're, we're working with. Um, I think it's a matter of just keeping your hand on the, on the wheel and understanding, you know, you know, the direction that you're going with this stuff and, and staying on top of, uh, top of these things. Because, you know, Alan mentioned um, a tax rate of, of, of 40% or, or thereabouts when sometimes when you get all done. Um, and he's not wrong. So again, that becomes a major player in how you can work cash flow going forward. So if you can manage your, ta your, your, your taxes uh, better, you know, that is a source of cash. And if you don't manage it real well, then it's a use of cash. And that's not, not where you want your money to go. But the, so the final message is take advantage of your advisors. Talk to people, have a relationship with the banker. And, you know, and, and, and also as I tell business, you can't be by yourself, talk to your legislature. You've got to be aggressive now. You've got to be aggressive. And that could be the difference between staying open and staying, staying alive. And uh, we always like to end uh, right on time. And, and before I, I go to the two of you, Mike and Alan, um, um, Courtney asked about the furlough bill. 
Tony, do you know anything about this furlough bill? A for two. If, if not, we'll get back to it. Yeah, she's talking about the Senate President Sweeney uh, had a bill about furlough and state employees, local employees, county employees. I think it's on the governor's desk. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm not. Yeah, sure that was that was just announced yesterday, wasn't it? I think. Yeah. Well, this was a bill that went through last week, I think. Right. Uh, and I'm not sure. I mean, the governor has 45 days to sign it, so I'm not sure what he's going to do. Um, yeah, but that's a, but again, if, if I read it correctly, the way it's worked, it's, it, the bill actually folds it in so that our state employees will be eligible for unemployment. So I think the way it's worded and the way it's going to work is, is that they'll be furloughed, um, I think, three days. So they'll basically work 40, 40 percent of the time, which lets them participate in the unemployment program. Right. Yeah, my gut tells me real quick that, you know, they're going to borrow the $9 billion and they're going to bond it because uh, the speaker already came out in favor of it. Obviously, the governor thought the HEROES Act would pass in Congress, you know, and maybe get some federal bailout. So I think that's how they fill the gap. I mean, that was the Senate president's intention on that bill, right. try to fill the gap, the budget deficit. Well, I think we're, we're at time. We try to end on time to be sensitive. You, you folks were amazing, as, uh, as always. Just Alan and Michael, just thank you very much. Um, that's the worst thing about Zoom. We can't have the formal clapping. But, uh, uh, but uh, yeah. We've we been doing this. <laughs> this. Thank you. It was excellent. And so take care. Good luck, everyone. Have a, a happy holiday weekend. Support small and family businesses if you can. And thank Tony, you. Thank you thank so you, much. Dale. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Be well, everybody. Be well, everybody.